In New York State, there are over a million freshwater fishermen. That's good, for fishing is one of the greatest tonics ever prescribed for mortal man. And no boy should ever be deprived of the thrill that goes with catching his first fish. Yes, there's a thrill in fishing for the old boys, too. This one retells the taking of his 26-pound lake trout in Fasico. Thrills for the gals as well. Thrills of all kinds, like this. Oh, baby. There's fishing the whole year round, too. Spring on the Osable. Watch that brown hit. He's got it. Three pounds of Adirondack brown trout in the spring with White Face Mountain towering in the background. In the lazy summer days, relax and enjoy this kind of deluxe fishing. Yes, this is summer fishing when you can sit back and enjoy the flash of the lake trout spoon. The hunter doesn't have a monopoly on autumn, season of the red gods. How the bass and the muskies smash in this cool weather. Now winter and the really rugged version of the sport. But thousands upon thousands are nuts about ice fishing on a thousand New York lakes. Catching smelt and pickerel, whitefish, great northern pike, perch and wall-eyed pike. Here's how they do it. Everything shows but the bulge in the hip pocket. Hey, mister, your tip-up's down. Here's the original chick sail on runners, a smelt fisherman's shanty on Champlain. Nature was plenty generous to New York with fishing waters, 60,000 miles of streams and over 8,000 lakes and big fishing ponds, many of them deep in the mountains, miles from the nearest road, world-famous waters, the Beaverkill, the Salmon, Esopus, Sacandega, Wiscoy, St. Lawrence, Osebo, Champlain, Lake George, the Saranacs, Cayuga, Seneca, Kiyuka, Chautauqua, Oneida, Otsego, and hundreds more. And New York has far more than its share of kinds of game fish as well. The brook trout, the brown trout, and the rainbow, the lake trout, and the landlocked salmon, first a baby and then papa salmon, the largemouth bass and the smallmouth, the crappie, perch, and the wall-eyed pike. And now the ones with big teeth in them, the pickerel and his bigger cousin, the great northern pike. And larger yet, the fighting muscalon. Maybe you like them really big, like the sturgeon. And now for the story, so that you can understand some of the factors working against good fishing. A new country opened up to the angler with trains, express highways, and cars with car top boats, and trailers, or perhaps a few fishing spots were out of quick reach, so man sprouted wings to take care of that. And things speeded up on the water, too, with outboards and speedboats. Yes, the wilderness came to the angler's back door, and fishing pressure increased enormously. Here's famous Catherine Creek on opening day with 2,000 automobiles along six miles of rainbow trout water. This big invasion created a conflict between two basic American concepts the right of the property owner to protect his land 
and the democratic ideal of fishing privileges for all. That's only part of the story. Civilization brought other problems. The ring of the axe sounded the death knell of bubbling springs and cool feeder streams. Down the rivers came the pulp wood. In the lake booms lay the saw logs. High to the heavens reached the wood piles cut from the banks of stream and river. Then the plow, first primitive. And they plowed up and down the hill, every furrow a ditch for the runaway raindrop. The runaway raindrops off the ground, not into it. And then the birth of the flood. In the wake of the flood, erosion, dried streams, ruined homes for fish, warm pools, once cool running water, erosion, trees gone from the land and plowed ditches for the runaway raindrops, off the land, not into it. Man built cities and factories, and on their heels came pollution, and in its wake, dead fish. Right along the art of angling and angling equipment improved too so that the poor fish gets a bad break no matter how you look at it. It's a long way from the boy's alder pole and the sunfish to this $60 rod with its fine reel, line and terminal tackle. and the wary brown it helped out with. Now we have lures of all shapes and sizes and colors that wiggle and wobble, palpitate and undulate. They do everything but reach out and grab the fish. And soon we'll probably have those that do that too. Why they even tie flies right on the banks of the streams. Here's a little lesson on how they do it. This is a wet fly, a parmesini bell, particularly good for New York's northern brook trout waters. The fly is in the vise. He wraps its wool body. Now, some tinsel. And dyed neck feathers from a rooster whirled around. A little lacquer finishes it. Yes, it's a terrific job to provide good fishing under these conditions. Floods, erosion, easier transportation, increasing pressure, less public water, pollution, better equipment. First, it takes lots of water. And although New York State has nearly three and a half million acres of fresh water, there must be quality besides quantity. Fish experts call it basic fertility. Water must be fertile to produce a crop of fish, just as soil must be fertile to grow vegetables. The fish food chain begins with fertility, microscopic plant and animal life, which in turn is fed upon by larger water insects. All sizes and shapes just like those plugs and spoons, and all colors, too. Queer critters, those caddisfly larvae which build homes around them. That's one at the lower right. All sorts of little crawly things that get bigger and bigger in the food chain until finally the minnows feed on them and in turn become fodder themselves for game fish. You know,
know an acre of water will only produce so many pounds of fish. And to find out how many pounds and why and why not, New York State's fish research men studied every single watershed and published these facts. On this work, the department bases its plan of fish management. This is the path to better fishing. First, laws. To protect the fish and their spawning beds. And to spread out and guide the harvest of the crop by man. and to protect the harvest by predatory fish themselves. Barrier dams are built to regulate the movements of fish to avoid too much competition for food. Here's a dam on the screwn, which lets out the water through its ingenious paddle, but keeps in the fish. Next is another kind of a dam on the Schoharie to keep bass from going upstream to compete with trout. Next tool of management is propagation. This tablet is to Seth Green, father of fish propagation in America. New York really shells them out from the state fish hatcheries, 22 of them from Long Island to Lake Erie and from the Catskills to the Northern Adirondacks. All kinds of hatcheries for the growing of all kinds of fish, trout, bass, pike perch, shad, whitefish, salmon and muscalunge, and capable of turning out the world's greatest production of fish as well. Here's the great plant at Rome, one of the largest of its kind in the world. And now let's get down to earth, beginning with a pool of spawning landlocked salmon to see how the hatcheries get their billions of eggs to do business with every year. Here's a crew of fisheries experts. No, not gold mining, but digging in that pool you saw a moment ago for spawned landlocked salmon eggs worth more than their weight in gold. These are wild spawned eggs being recovered for experimental work only. The main quota of salmon eggs is obtained from hatchery breeders. Eggs for walleye pike, muscalunge, and lake trout are stripped from wild fish taken in New York waters with nets. Here a net in Chautauqua Lake holds giant musky breeders. a big 35 pound female. Doesn't hurt the fish a bit and they are returned unharmed to the water. A female this size will hold about three quarts of eggs. Here we have taken wall-eyed pike and a trap net in Oneida Lake for the stripping process. There's far less mortality in hatchery hatching and rearing than in the wild, so it pays to give nature a helping hand here. Now the boats are coming in with their tubs laden with walleyes, often called pike perch to the Constantia Hatchery on Oneida. If they aren't ready for stripping, not right. They're kept a few days in holding pools until they are. First the female is stripped of her yellow eggs. Then the white milk from the male is added. Often it takes several of the small males to fertilize the eggs from a single female. 
When the eggs of the female hit the water, they're like compressed, punctured tennis balls, which immediately expand and suck in both water and milk. Thus, they are fertilized. Here's a lake trout crew far out on Seneca Lake. The right horizon looks like the ocean. This is one of the very finest lake trout waters in the world, with sports anglers taking over 500 tons a year. The breeders are held first in tanks. Then they are tested. This first fish being stripped is a 15 pound female, which soon will go back into the lake for catching, maybe next year. Eggs, you'll note, are handled very gently. Eggs for brook, brown, and rainbow trout are taken from hatchery breeders. Bass eggs must be spawned naturally, since these fish can't be stripped. But no matter the kind of eggs, they are usually transported in shipping cases. That's only the beginning. The eggs are tempered with water. Then they are sterilized. And then they are measured to get an accurate count. Next, they are put in troughs with a constant flow of cold spring water. In the troughs, the dead eggs are picked out by hand. If they're pike or muscalange eggs, they're hatched in jars like these. 